the new information for me. Um, and the Freelon family and all the, the really cool things that they're doing. There's so many, it's so culturally rich with so many artists and activists and just people who really deeply, genuinely care about their, their city and their place in the city and their place in the world. Um, and I, I'm really, really privileged to be a part of that. Um, okay, you're, so, def- you're definitely part of it. There's no doubt about that. Um, what were some of the things that surprised you when you got to Nashville? Like I said, you came from Burlington. You hadn't moved to Durham yet. So you went into Nashville, and we all know that Nashville is a rich musical community. So when you fell into that uh, situation in your 20s and everything, what surprised you about the Nashville music scene, uh, both the good and the bad? Because, like I said, we all know that everybody, that when they get involved in music, they wind up doing jobs like you just mentioned. They wind up being bartenders or somehow involved in jobs to pay the bills because until you get discovered or until something happens that it uh, changes your income, you wind up doing a lot of uh, survival jobs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think there there was a number of things that really surprised me. Um, I think going, I had kind of a – a TV idea of Nashville. And there were some parts of that that were true. I mean, really writing down music row, you could see uh, any famous person at any given moment. You'd be sitting at the bar and look over and there's Winona Judd. And, oh, hi. <laughs> and uh, Faith Hill and Tim McGraw were regular custor- customers of mine. And um, it was really interesting just running into people. And um, I I kind of lived with my head under a rock. I didn't. I didn't really know a lot of the artists that were actually in Nashville. I wasn't a huge country music fan. Um, so there would be sometimes I would be just chatting it up with someone and then, uh, and then I would turn around to someone else and they'd say, do you know who you're talking to? <laughs> That's Dina Carter. And I'd be like, Oh, is she a big deal? Or, <laughs> well, yeah, she was a pretty big deal then when I was in Nashville. Um, so I think that was a little bit surprising um, for me. And um, I, I think, some of the some of the bad things that were surprising, um, it was surprising how much money you did not make because you were just one of so many people who were desiring to be discovered. And really, when I came to Nashville, it was it was kind of at this tail end of an era where being discovered was like a really big thing, and you would just you would play at the Bluebird and you would play at these um, downtown spots in Nashville in order to be heard and be discovered and be the next rising star. Um, but, but when I was, when I was there in, um, in 2004, 2005, um, during that era, really my space was starting to go away and Facebook was starting to crop up. Social media was really starting to, to be a wildfire and, um, and then technology became accessible to your average everyday Joe. So people would have home studios instead of having to to pay for studio time, which was outrageously expensive in Nashville. So really, um, most, most of my success was kind of self-made. And instead of waiting to be discovered, I learned um, that I don't really need that. I can, I can kind of promote my own stuff and, and find my own crowd and use my own voice and, and use my own friends and really be largely in control of where I went and what I sang and who I sang to, and, and I really appreciated that. So it was a it was an interesting time to be in Nashville. There was definitely several people who held that um, that that belief and still do hold that belief of of wanting to be discovered and and feeling like you can go and be discovered. And certainly it still does happen. But um, I'm I'm much more of an independent person. I think an independent artist. So um, I think I discovered that about myself. What were some of the uh, who were some of the people that you performed with that folks might know when you were in Nashville that you actually worked with in the studios or even in small home studios? Were there any name acts? I've never asked you that, so I don't know if there were any name acts that you actually had the chance of performing with when you were in Nashville. Oh gosh, you've never asked me that. I don't know if anybody would know anybody I performed with. Everybody were just home kind of homegrown musicians. Like I was saying, it was this really incredible time. Um, where we were discovering you don't actually need this need the big studio and you don't need the big um, producers to to <laughs> allow you to to make a living and you can make your own tours and things like that. So I 
I traveled around with a, a little group called Motivational Speakers and a group called uh, Estimated Profit. I was a part of a, a band called the Nappy Earl Band. I worked with Matt Jaggers, and um, Matt Matt Jaggers is uh, the guitarist for um, Uberphonics, who's still in Nashville and has um, got some pretty wide acclaim. Uh, he and I were musical partners together and wrote wrote lots of songs together um, for several years uh, before I left Nashville. So I think those would probably be the, the biggest names that I've performed with. Well, that definitely keep you busy while you were in Nashville. And then, like you said, you decided that uh, – what, what drove you back to North Carolina after having been in Nashville? Was it that your parents were getting older and you wanted to move back with them, or was it just a, a time to get away from Nashville in that point of your life? Yeah, I think at that point in my life um, I was – uh, I was just turning 26, and uh, I was I was pregnant with my daughter, and I really wanted to be closer to my family for my daughter's sake. And I, it was a it was time for a new journey for me um, of being a mom. I think one of the one of the things uh, kind of an ideology that was really prevalent in Nashville at that time is that you can't you have an expiration date and you have an expiration date as an artist and as a musician, especially, especially as a front man, as a singer. Um, and that having a family and being on the road is really uh, difficult and really you just can't do it. And uh, being a mom and being a musician, you just really don't do that. You're just basically done. And I don't know if I really held on to that, but I, I think I might have kind of believed a little bit of that lie. Um, and so I I moved uh, closer to be with my family for sure, for my daughter's sake. Um, but in my heart, I think I had a, a little bit of defeat. Um, I, I think I thought my time was over. Um, little, little did I know that there was much more, much, much more to come. Yeah, because now you are, like I said, tell us how you came about getting attached to um, Price Central and how you became the music director and how you have formed this band, which, like I said, is an amazing band. You've got some folks that have got ties to Central. You've got some folks that have uh, ties to just the musical world. So you've definitely put together a very strong band. And like I said before, I know that that's one of my highlights of every Sunday is hearing y'all perform. Yeah, it's one of the highlights of my entire life, <laughs> being a part of this particular band. It's just an incredible an incredible group to be a part of. And um, I, I definitely am the, the least talented person on the stage. And I think for, for that reason alone, it's it's really incredible Sunday to Sunday to work with these talented musicians who are up and coming young artists and um, just to be a part of their story and to, to be able to walk life with them and um, just be a family with one another. It's been a real privilege for me. Um, I came to Christ Central actually the very first day that they were officially a church, and um, it was a it was January of 2014, um, and I did not even know that it was the first Sunday. It happened to be a church. Well, I was looking for a church, and it happened to be a church that I wouldn't be late to because it started at 10. Some of the other churches started at 9:30, and I'm I'm a late bird, so. <laughs> I, I could make it there on time. So um, my daughter and my son and I, we, we went to the church and I came in and was greeted at the door um, just very warmly and it just felt like home. So um, I came in and I listened to the sermon and um, and it was just really powerful and it, and it grabbed me and I just continued to come back and I never left. Um, I, I didn't, I decided to, to be a little anonymous for a while. I didn't want to lead music um, right away um, just for personal reasons. I had been, I had been leading a very large congregation in the Durham area um, of over a thousand members. And I did feel very um, known and unknown. And uh, that was a hard place to be in spiritually for me at that time. And so I decided uh, a smaller church home would be, beneficial for me and and a place who maybe didn't know exactly who I was or or what I brought to the table and um so they I think they respected that for for a good little while and then um it just so happened that I sang a little too loud one Sunday and the pastor heard and then <laughs> asked if I would be interested in helping to lead worship and um I I said no <laughs> I'm not going to do that right now but 
uh, maybe ask me another time. And so it came to pass that one one Sunday they they needed a director to stand in in the place of the really amazing directors they had at the very beginning uh, who started um, started the church, Sam Best and uh, Rose Reddick. Um, really incredible musicians, and, and their hearts for the Lord was just beautiful. Um, but they really developed a music program in the very beginning. And they were going to be out of town, and so uh, Daniel Mason, the lead pastor, he asked if I would be willing to, to lead. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll lead this one time. And then it, was, it just took the one time to be up there and to be with these particular musicians um, that were that were there at the time. Donovan Cheatham is a, the drummer, and he's an incredible jazz drummer. He was attending Central at the time. Is now an alumni uh, from Central with from the jazz uh, drum performance program. And um, and Jacob Klassen was the pianist at the time. He was also attending Central, studying piano and uh, jazz piano performance. And uh, it was just, it wasn't. It didn't take me long just to feel like I, this is. This is absolutely a home that I can be a part of. And so I started to just lead, and it was a volunteer basis. Um, and then uh, Sam and Rose graduated, and they were moving, and there was an open position. And we went through a couple of different directors. Um, I can't say everything went super smoothly during that time. Um, and Daniel actually asked me four or five different times if I would, if I would consider taking this role as the director and I, and I turned him down almost every time, uh, which is kind of surprising to me now when I look back at it. Um, the last time it was really monumental for me. The last time he asked me, uh, Candace, will you, will you do this job? And I said, Daniel, what if I'm not prepared? What if I'm not equipped? I have never been to school to, to be a director. I don't really know what it takes. I know how to worship lead. I know how to sing. I'm a good musician, but I don't know if I know how to do this. And, um, and he said, but Candace, what if you do, what if you actually are absolutely equipped to do this? Because I believe you are. And so I said, okay, I, all right. And that's, that's what happened. <laughs> I've been there now for four years as the director and have seen the team, the, the band grow. Um, tremendously. We brought on uh, Annalise Stahls. Um, she is a tremendous saxophone player. I, one of the cleanest tones I've heard out of a saxophone. She's beautiful. Um, Ariel Pocock is our pianist. Um, if you know who Ariel is, she's a world traveling musician. She's got quite a bit of uh, notoriety, but um, her humble heart and her ease, like just being able to work with her is so easy and she just makes everything feel so good. And of course, Alfonso Key, he's a um, real integral part of what we do. He he lays down those bass lines, and God, it, just, it feels good. You can't help but sing to it. It's amazing. So, um, and then of course I've got Autumn Rainey by my side singing uh, with lead vocals, and I've got um, Marvin Thorne as my assistant. Um, so really, it's just a a, a plus team. I could not ask for a better team, and that was all. I, I won't say it was serendipitous. It was absolutely God. So, because one of the things that I've always found amazing, and I don't think it was planned, it just happened to be that way. But I know one of the things that is always preached within the church is the whole concept of inclusiveness and trying to reach out to definitely different ethnic groups and different things of that nature, and. The, even though you don't come necessarily from that background, the choir itself um, and the band definitely has a very much of almost a, uh, for lack of a better term, an African American kind of feel. So even though the it, it it doesn't sound like a typical Presbyterian band, I guess that's the best way to put it. No, no, it it absolutely doesn't, which is why I think uh, people are so surprised when they when they come and participate in in a service because we do sound a lot different. Um, uh, we we all come from such a different cultural background within just within our music, and some of us were churched, some of us were not churched. We and we all come with our particular um, cultural upbringing, and and what we make together just it really just happens to work. And I love the way that it sounds. Now, you know our our rhythm section is 
is African American, and and so as we know, <laughs> that's the foundation that we're standing on.